Hello, everyone. Welcome. Welcome, welcome. I'd like to start with a bit of housekeeping. As I see, we still have a few people joining. Um, I know everyone's quite used to using Zoom by now, but I wanted to point out that we're presenting this in webinar format, so your videos and microphones will be turned off. However, if you have any questions, and we definitely encourage questions because we do have a Q&A session later, um, so please type your questions into the Q&A box, which is down at the bottom of your screen, and we'll direct those to Dr. Janin when you, she has finished doing her presentation. Um, you will have seen that we're recording this, so we will send a link out to that email to you next week. Um, and so with that admin out of the way, it's time to get the webinar officially started. So again, welcome everyone. I'm Veronica Coyle from Data for Good, um, and I'm joining you today from the lands of the Gadigal clan of the Eora Nation, with my behind the scenes host, Sam, joining from the lands of the Darwell Nation. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the various lands from which we are gathering, albeit virtually today, and we pay our respects to the elders, past, present, and emerging community elders, elders across all lands. So for everyone joining us today, please feel free to use the chat box to say hi, um, and we'd love to hear where you're joining from. I just wanna take a moment to remind you that Data for Good is all about inspiring and enabling people with data skills to use their skills and their passion to benefit humanity. So one of the things that we do as part of that is we work with not-for-profits um, to, again, to be able to share those skills and to basically enable them to achieve things with data that they might not have been able to without the help of our volunteers. So if you're from a data for good, uh, sorry, if you're from a not-for-profit and you want to reach out to data for good, you can reach us at connect at dataforgood.com.au. Um, so, having said that, I'd like to um, introduce you to our guest speaker today, who's uh, Dr. Janin Briedehoft. Now, Janin it works for the Workplace Gender Equality Agency, and she leads the team that's responsible for data management, analysis, and benchmarking research and education functions of the Workplace Gender Equality Agency. She's also been integral to the development of the agency's new data management system, including the design of data visualizations and the creation of the data strategy. A key aspect of Janin's role is unlocking the potential of the agency's world leading data set through internal and external collaboration to enhance gender equality in the workplace. So thank you very much for joining us today, Janin, um, and I will hand over to you. Thank you very much, Veronica. Hello, everyone. And um, I'm very thrilled to be here today. And thank you so much for the invitation, Veronica, and Data for Good. It's always really a pleasure to be able to showcase the data that um, we collect and what organizations are doing the data, which is the topic of today. But before I start, I would also like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which I'm speaking today, which is the Gadigal people of the Aurora Nation. And um, also before I start, I thought I, in preparing this presentation today, it's been a little while since I've done a presentation on data really, I thought one thing I really noticed and um, which is a really great achievement is that I feel the shift, there has been a shift from sort of the presentations I'm giving in the data space well, it was before a couple of years ago, a lot about, you know, justifying gender equality data and gender data and why it's important and how we collect it and why organizations should do a gender pay gap analysis. Today, the conversation has shifted to how can we actually use the data to drive change in the, in the space of gender equality. So that's been a really, really great sort of shift that I have observed. And so the invitation from Data for Good came at a, really interesting point in time because the topic is how can data help closing the gender gap and the gender pay gap. Today I will 
run you through the role of the WGEA, the Workplace Gender Equality Agency. I will show a couple of national trends and then I'll focus on case studies of organisations that have used data to, to, share, to, to drive change in their organisations before I then close off with a couple of key takeaways. So the Workplace Gender Equality Agency is, uh, is it's historically grown out of the Affirmative Action Equal Employment Opportunity for Women Act in 1986. Then it um, turned into the Equal Opportunity for Women in the Workplace Act. And in 19, uh, sorry, and in 2012, the Workplace Gender Equality Act was created. Now I'm like to point this out because this also represents sort of a shift from focusing on qualitative data collection of organizations towards um, collecting quite, quite, quite quantitative data through the Workplace Gender Equality Act. So the act was established in 2012, as I say, and it's a federal statutory agency. We're charged with promoting improving gender equality in Australian workplaces. And under that, all non-public sector employers with 100 or more employees are required to report their gender equality data to us on an annual basis. So we have now about seven years of a longitudinal data set, which is really impressive. And compared to internationally, how other countries would collect data, Australia's um, gender equality or gender collection system is really quite advanced. And I'll get into that a little bit more later. Um, so we are a regulator, but we also, our act also requires us to educate in influence in the space of workplace gender equality agents, uh, gender equality. So what data are we collecting? So we are collecting data in, across six of, that we call gender equality indicators. And um, this is the first three are the gender composition of the workforce, where we look at the representation of women and men in different leadership levels, but also in occupational levels. We're also looking at, or we're also asking organizations to provide data on the gender composition of their governing bodies. And then we also require organization to, um, to submit their data on pay mm -hmm. to us. And that is base salary pay, but also total remuneration pay. And under total remuneration, we're looking at bonuses, superannuation, and other discretionary pay. So this is really, yeah, they are submitting their data through a workplace profile. So each organization is submitting their data through a workplace profile. Um, then we also, and this is quite unique, I think, in terms of if we look internationally and other or other countries collecting data, we also asking organizations to fill out a questionnaire. And in this questionnaire, we're looking at do organizations have flexible working arrangements? Do they have parental leave? Do they consult with employees? And what sort of sex-based harassment and discrimination policies and practices do they have? So it's quite a comprehensive set of um, data that we are collecting. Um, I'm going to show you now a little bit of the national um, trends that we have um, across the data set. Um, so our data set this year covers over 4.3 million employees. That's about 40% of the workforce in Australia. Keeping in mind, we are only collecting data from non-public sector organizations. So the public sector would be um, um, probably another 40% of the workforce. And of course, there's small and medium businesses that we also do not collect. And the gender split in our um, data set is fairly even, 50% women, almost 50% men. A lot of the uh, employees in the data set work full time, over half, 53%, part time employees, 21.5%, and casual employees, 25%. We can and we have the data also split by gender. So we know that the workforce, the part time employees, the majority of these employees are female, whereas the majority of um, employees in the full time record are male. Um, then we are looking at also the national trends. I think it's very important, women in leadership. So we are collecting data of leadership and we have sort of these responsibility levels that we ask organizations to uh, submit their data to us. And as you can see, the yellow here describes and looks at um, 
women, the grey is the proportion of men in leadership. So while at the Australian workforce it's quite 50-50, um, we can see that the men in management level, the higher we go up the pipeline, the more the proportion of women um, sort of declines up until the CEO heads of business, only 18% of CEOs are female in Australia. So this is sort of the leaking pipeline that we can uh, nicely display here. At the same time, we have seen over the years that we have recorded since 2013 and 14, there has been a steady increase in the female representation in leadership and at every level. And one of the biggest increases actually has been in the category of the key management personnel. So that's really um, heartening to see. At the same time, um, we do also, as I said before, we collect the data on, the, on pay. The national gender pay gap over time, I have only data here since 2015, but also since 2013, has been on a steady decline. And we see the gender pay gap um, the base salary gender pay gap at 15% now and the total remuneration gender pay gap at 20.1%. Uh, so, so you can see that over time, the gender pay gap has been slowly, fall, slowly falling and going down, which is also great to see. And which accounts, which really is a testament of organizations doing some work and using their gender data to really drive change in this area. Um, so, but what we can also see that it is the discretionary pay, the bonus pay, that the gender pay gap is higher with 21%. So, which means that um, that we know that women do miss out on bonus pays and, and discretionary pay. That's annually accounts to the 20% accounts to $25,000 in Australia. We also ask when I ask organizations whether they have done, whether they have used the data to do a gender pay gap analysis. And you can see here in the top chart that the percentage of organizations who conducted a gender pay gap analysis has increased, really has had a big increase between 2015 and 2016. So there was a big push for organizations to conduct a gender pay gap analysis. And since then, we've seen a steady increase, but it's slowed down. Needless to say that this is really great that so many organizations are doing a gender pay gap analysis, are using their data to drive change. However, what we can see here in the chart below is the percentage of organizations that took action after a gender pay gap. And we define actions a little bit more in the questionnaire, but overall we can see that there's still 40% of organizations who do tend to not take any actions after they've done the gender pay gap analysis. And only 60% of organizations um, do actually action after they find they've done a gender pay gap analysis. A lot of organizations say they did not find any gender pay gaps and they say that um, their gender pay gaps are justifiable. Um, and that is something that sort of, you know, the data might, might, might show and we encourage them to really then investigate further their gender pay gaps, which I will show you in my um, case studies in a bit. Um, the agency also engages with other researchers to have a little bit more of a deep dive into the data. And I think one of the most impressing work that we've done um, with the Bankwest Curtin Partnership and Curtin University is last year's Gender Equality Insights Report, because this report has made it really, really clear that there are financial benefits from having more gender balance at the top levels of leadership. It revealed a really strong and convincing causal relationship between increasing the number of women in leadership and subsequent improvements in company performance. The researchers have really matched the company performance data from ASX companies in Australia with our longitudinal data set and really could see that, it, that an increase in the share of top tier female managers of 10% has led to more than a 6.6 increase in the market value of ASX listed companies. And this is worth and evaluated about 104 million Australian dollar 
for the average company. So while we already knew that there is a strong link between diversity, gender equality and company performance, for the first time, I think this report has really shown that there is a causal relationship between the two variables. Um, um, the agency then, after organisations to report to us, we have a couple of different data outputs. We do have an Australian gender equality scorecard where we display all our findings on a national level and by industry. We also provide organisations with the so-called competitor analysis benchmark report, where we provide them with an idea of how they compare against their competitors in the industry and in class or division. What we do also do is we have publicly available data because all our data except for the organisational pay, pay data um, we are making publicly available on our, on our WGA Data Explorer. And this is really quite an interesting tool that I would like to show you. So I will stop sharing this screen and move to sharing another screen, um, which I hope goes relatively smoothly. Um, there we go. Um, this screen shows, this is our Data Explorer. And it really does, you can, like organisations, employees, um, employers, really everyone can go into our data explorer and really explore the data that we have. It is by industry. Um, I will not go in depth more into that, but what I think is a very good or a very interesting function that gets used more and more is that we have the data here by organisation and I've just typed here in Atlassian. Um, but here, um, people are, you are enabled to look at what is the gender composition of the organization overall and how does it compare to its, you know, you can choose whether it would be class or here it's the professional and scientific um, industry, but overall it's possible to go further down the class and look at the gender composition of, the, of each organization. And we know that more and more organisations are using this tool. They are benchmarking themselves, particularly also they, what organisations are interesting in, interested in who has got parental leave policies and how do I compare with my parental leave policy against one other organisations? Do I have competitive edge parental leave policies? Okay, I now hand over to the to the host to show a little video and move over to looking at how organizations have been using um, gender pay gap analysis to drive change. So I stop share here and hand over to Data for Good to show a video. The history of our pay gap analysis goes back to 2007 uh, where we pulled the data together. It um, was a little bit of a shock for us at that time. Uh, in fact, our organisation's overall pay gap at that time was a staggering 43%. Uh, so it really was um, something that we all sat up and took notice of and really something that, that we clearly understood um, action needed to happen. So we pull all of our data together and um, we look at that across levels. So we look at our levels of management, um, for example, our level twos, which are our seniors and superintendents. We look at the gender composition of that level of management to determine what the composition is and what the average um, salary is for men at those levels and what the average salary for women is at those levels. So we divide that also against our trades and technicians um, so that we can identify where our um, biggest areas are uh, the other thing we do is we uh, do look at our like for like as well. So, and we look at roles, men and women in the same role to ensure that there's parity. And, um, you know, sometimes there are differences, slight differences, and we make sure that those differences are justified. So for the next couple of years after 2007, uh, we obviously put a, a number of initiatives in place. In 2010, we uh, started to implement and set up diversity objectives. Uh, and some of those objectives were about reducing our organisational overall pay gap, but also about increasing the proportion of women 
uh, women in the workforce and also about increasing the number of women returning after parental leave. We've analysed our data monthly, actually since 2011, so oh, we're very, very close to our data and uh, we've done that for a number of reasons uh, because we found that if we were only doing that once a year, so much happens in between and we weren't really able to identify our focus areas. So by pulling the, the data monthly, we're able to see um, with turnover and with new starters, just what impact that has on not just the gender composition, but also our pay equity gap. I think that's been the real secret to our success. Uh, certainly around increasing our um, proportion of women in the workforce. Uh, so when we were looking at our data, um, you know, we had a 16% gender composition. We've been able to bring that up to 26% in, in three years. And only because we knew what the data was telling us. I'm quite surprised, still in reading the WGA report, that 73% of reporting companies still do not analyse their data. And I guess what I would leave them with is, if you don't know your data, then you don't know your problem, you don't know your issues, and you really can't action that. Thank you. I'll go back to sharing my screen with the PowerPoint presentation. So this is pretty impressive example, even though it's um, it's from it's from 2007. It still is um, very impressive, and that it, it, so Barbara was one of the early adopters of using our tools and our gender pay gap calculator and really driving change in this. Uh, it's a mining industry, male dominated industry. So we have um, a gender pay gap calculator, which is freely downloadable on our website for organizations and organizations can really use this calculator to look at the representation um, across their entire, the representation of women and men across their organizations, look at actual gender differences, gender pay differences by level, and um, look at gen relative gender pay gaps. Just here, um, a little snapshot of the gender pay gap calculator is a really great tool. And more and more organizations are using the tool. For example, HESTA has also used um, this tool to analyze their gender pay gaps in their organizations. And they we looked at salary data by gender, by position level, full-time, part-time. And this data also formed sort of the basis for a new action for, plan for them and their aim was really to prepare be prepared for future growth um, with a fo proactive focus on equality and um, while they didn't find any instances of unequal pay in their agenda pay gap analysis they noticed that difference in earnings in the organizations overall uh, between men and women and noticed that they had to do something to increase and the workforce composition they had some actions here, the actions here that they then um, implemented, you know, unconscious bias training, working with leaders to champion gender diversity. I think what I, why I put this example here and what I think is the most important part is that HESA did a gender pay gap analysis, looking at uh, quantitative data analysis, but they also moved into communicating and talking to their employees and staff and then developed a, and establish the best solutions for their organizations to make sure um, that they have the best way forward for the future of the organization. So it, you know, we have so much data and we can provide so much data, but we, we mustn't forget that the qualitative data and the human interaction still is very important in order to create the best sort of actions for every organization. Oricon as well has done, um, has looked at their data very much and so, and they have sort of seen that 29% the, um, 20, of their workforce, of their technical workforce was female. And that is something that they wanted to improve. And they really did an action plan on targeting recruitment and um, progression and, and retention in their agent, in their, in their agency, sorry, in their organizations. And what they did, they 
they really did prioritise gender equality and inclusion as a business strategy and their overall strategy. And they also did look at or change the policies, change the language in their policies, scanned where the policies had biases, had gender neutral languages, and where appropriate changed it towards gender neutral languages, language, implemented parental leave and um, flexible policies for all. And they also set targets to improve their workforce and for women in the workforce. And they really reached their target of 35% female representation by 2019. So they did really, really impressive work actually um, in showing how these actions can, how data actions can then improve and create outcomes that are really impressive. Um, so I won't read through this in the interest of time, um, but yes, another very impressive outcome here, improving the gender balance using data, using data to really target um, specific areas, specific focus areas, and then you, strategically implementing and looking at, at, um, at these and having outcomes that are pretty impressive. Um, I thought I'd finish off with a little bit of a um, sort of future looking or other trends that we can see in terms of how organizations use data. Um, more and more organizations come to us and ask about um, AI and data modeling. So particularly AI, more, more, or more and more organizations are using machine learning to um, particularly for recruitment. And um, there, there are a lot of advantages or there are a lot of um, uh, opportunities that we can see. For example, job descriptions can be phrased through text analysis software and some technology drawn social media and other public data so to supplement application information. Although some positive effects are really reported using AI enabled system in this way, we are really monitoring uh, some of these systems and reviewing some of the system because what we know is that women and girls are underrepresented in IT and also in STEM uh, fields. So this might create the potential for um, inbuilt biases in these systems. Now, for example, studies have found that women receive fewer ads on Google encouraging high paying jobs compared to men, or my machine learning algorithm may privilege male candidates' resume. And needless to say that there is evidence that um, increasing diversity can happen through AI embedded system. Unilever, for example, has used AI systems to increase the workforce and they increase the socioeconomic diversity of their workforce in the recruitment pool. Similarly, Atlassian has also increased um, the hiring of women in technical roles um, using AI technology. And in addition, what I find more that organizations come to us and using data modeling techniques and um, to predict employee retention and attraction particularly, there's, there's really, looking at particular cohorts and why these cohorts of employees would leave and what does it mean, what, how does it predict the future of retention in these particular um, organisations. So this is also certainly a space to watch and that we also keep an eye and watch in terms of how data is being used. So to finish off, I think um, data analysis is becoming more and more key to drive gender equality and diversity across Australian organisations, which, as I said, is great. Um, data analysis being used for assessing and monitoring the state of gender equality. It's building accountability, a building accountability A, because organizations have to report to us, but also we encourage organizations to take account, to be accountable within their own organizations to drive this change. It's creating, it helps create suitable policies and actions. It's comparing organizational performance. It enables us to benchmark and therefore use the data for recruitment, particularly attraction and retention of talent. It does close the gender pay gap, including the gender pay gap, if an analysis is undertaken. And ultimately, it really improves employee well-being. So that would be all from me. Um, I stop sharing now and thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Jen, and that was excellent. So some excellent graphs in there, and it definitely was, um, you know, pr provoked some questions. Um, so I'm going to start with a question from Lauren. 
who has asked, um, she says, my company has mainly women at the, hang on, it just jumped. My company has mainly women at the executive level. The insights say a balance in gender and leadership leads to better company performance, et cetera. And she's asking, should we be better off to aim to bring in more men for a 50-50 split? Yes. Yeah. That is generally what we're saying. Gender equality often goes both ways. We um, not only like, we don't want female only, neither male only, like gender diversity in every stage, whether it's in female organizations or male, yes, is the way to go. Yeah, excellent. Um, and uh, another question from our audience. Is there data comparing Australia's actions to other countries? So are initiatives from other and are there initiatives from other countries that uh, should be encouraged and measured here? Mm -hmm. um, we do have on our website a little paper that looks at international other international reporting regimes. We have a little bit of contacts and network uh, so internationally. For example, the United Kingdom always comes up and they require organizations to publish their organization-wide gender pay gaps and quartiles and in different sort of sliced differently. And it's interesting to look at what, at that. And we, we certainly look at it because in Australia, we cannot publish organization-wide gender pay gap data. And it's been suggested that organizations should do it. We know that some organizations are doing that um, on a regular basis in their social reports or in their social, uh, in their annual reports, I should say. What we find though is the combination of the qualitative data or the survey data about policies and practices that are available with the workforce composition and the gender pay gap is really so great because it shows change and it shows what does what what does what does change the balance, what does change the gender pay gap. There's other research that shows that the more flexible working policies and are available in organizations, the higher the proportion of women in leadership. So we can see so much more with the combination of this data than only with the gender pay gap. Awesome. Mm. Um, another question is, uh, do you have any data on women from non-English speaking backgrounds? No, we don't. Um, unfortunately, we don't have diversity or the act clearly specified that we collect um, sex, women and men. Um, we do have a new reporting, we build a reporting system which will be live in April where we will account for gender acts as a, on a voluntary basis, but we have no other further um, diversity or in, in intersectionality available. Okay, yeah. I love um, what we were addressing or what, what your presentation covered today was how organizations can use data to help address the gender pay gap. And certainly you know, being a data person myself, I, you know, I know I'm constantly saying you, you have to be able to measure something and measure improvement in order to encourage um, you know, people to celebrate successes and, and to, to give a program life or to continue um, to, to, to go on and make a difference. Um, have we found, or have you any observations on um, what roles in an organization need to be involved to be successful in, in changing their position? Yes, all the data that we can see shows that what is really important is that senior leadership, senior levels, and also the boards are being accountable. Um, for this change. So we can see, because one in, a, in our one question, for example, is are you showing your results of the gender pay gap analysis to the executives and or to the board? So we see that organizations whose organizations in which um, the results get reported to boards and executives reduce their gender pay gaps more and are just more active. So accountability is really, really important in this space. And that's a really interesting finding too. Yeah, no, you make a great point there. Um, we're a little mm -hmm. short on time, but I might squeeze in one more question. Um, so we've got one from a male professional in IT, data and analytics. He believes there's a problem in the gender gap. Um, however, many of his colleagues don't perceive that. Um, so the question is, how do you 
properly explain the problem to the unaware male workforce? I, I think we need help there. <laughs> <laughs> we need evangelists um, such as this person. <laughs> yeah, um, I do think that Cordelia Fine has uh, the, the book that she wrote about how data is biased towards men because men, you know, create apps and I think the uh, menstruation tracking app was created years later and people, women that tend to be seen forgotten in these areas. I, I do think there's a lot more work to do. I, I totally agree and it's a good idea I, I should pursue, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, one of the um, materials that you mentioned in your presentation was the Gender Equity Insights Report. Um, would you be okay if we share a link to that after the presentation, because that might be helpful? Um, and also a link to the Data Explorer, because I think, you know, for everyone who's joining this webinar from within Australia, I think it would be really useful to um, go in, look and see, um, you know, if your organization has participated, where you've rated, or even to understand what the levels are within your industry as well. So it'd be great if you can share that link for all of those people who, are, who really want to know where we are before we make a change. Yeah, absolutely. Pleasure to share every all, all these reports and yeah. Yeah. All right. Awesome. Well, we'll send that out with the email along with the video link. Um, so I'm sorry we haven't quite got to everyone's questions. Oh, I think we've got quite a few of them. Um, there is one, does the WGEA publish information on how it calculates its indicators? So that's so that organization to prove how we measure our gender gaps between the WGEA reporting periods. Between the periods? Yeah, so I, I guess if they want to be measuring themselves between the re reporting WGEA periods. Oh, okay, okay. What we do, the, the gender pay gap um, calculator that we have so because the agency really doesn't collect in-depth uh, data in terms of occupational categories, for example, we really encourage organizations to do the gender pay gap analysis, download the tool, and the tool, the gender pay gap analysis tool will enable you to really slice the data by tenure and by uh, promotion so that, and by different levels of seniority. Uh, because we know that some sometimes the designer group they say well they justify these gender pay gaps because they're senior designers and junior designers and that's the data we don't have and so this tool enables organizations to do that and then um, really take action from there yeah awesome so I'm conscious we're we're running a little over time but there are still a few questions coming in and, and it looks like most of the participants have stayed on um, so I will ask one more. It says the work WGEA is doing with organizations is fantastic. Is there anything you are doing to encourage female employees to be more ambitious with their careers and salaries so that we can address the GPG from both ends? Um, that gives us the example you mentioned, the AI initiative. Yeah, the AI initiatives, we, we're working on that. But also we have a couple of tools on, you know, in negotiation that I think for women, research those that women do not, women also do negotiate, often they, they don't get what they negotiate. So we have a, we have some employee tools just to simple, just to, you know, get them familiar with how to negotiate or what to be aware of when to negotiate. And um, a couple of other things as well with looking at well, just this employee well-being, are flexible working policies and practices available? and have uh, are training opportunities available and um, things like that. So those sort of guides we have as well on our website that are helpful for these kinds of questions. Yeah, yeah. So for anyone in the audience who hasn't been to the WGEA website, um, you know, it, it does have, you know, besides the data, it's got a wealth of resources and information. Um, so I strongly encourage everyone to go there. And again, we will share that link after the presentation. All right, having said that, um, I think it's probably time to wrap up because we really have gone a few minutes over and I know there might be a few people keen to go have their lunch. 
Um, so, Janin, thank you so much for joining us. Really appreciated the information you presented today. I think it's uh, an important topic that we all need to spend more time thinking about and discussing. Um, so I thank you so much for your presentation today. And I also want to thank all of the attendees for joining us. Um, and again, you'll be able to uh, view this uh, via the recording, link, which we'll send out next week. Um, but if you have any additional questions, please email us at connect at dataforgood.com.au. So again, thank you and goodbye. Bye, all.